1 Kings chapter 3. Thought long and hard about what to do today. Two or three incidences through the week and in the past month or so. I really feel like that the Lord, not me, I really feel like the Lord would like to speak to a few of us today. A few of us that are trying hard. Anybody trying hard? I had an old preacher tell me, he said, it's easy to live for God hard, but it's hard to live for God easy. It's hard just to take it easy, but it's easy to live for God if you're giving it everything you got. And, but we all want to take it easy. And we all want things to go good. I, I was preaching a couple of weeks ago about trouble. And uh, I was sitting with a friend of mine at lunch a week or so later, and he said, you were preaching about that. And I thought, well, he's not preaching to me. I don't have any trouble. But the trouble was already going on, and he didn't even know it. And I'm not preaching about trouble today. I'm preaching about dreams. And I want to talk to you about how expensive they are. And Solomon loved the Lord. Somebody say amen. Walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and burned incense in high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy. According as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness. Thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give, therefore, thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing, and God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither asked for riches for thyself, nor asked for life, for the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart. Listen to what he said. I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that what? There has not been anyone like you before nor shall there arise one after you. No one before, no one after, like Solomon. Verse 14, And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways and keep my statutes and my commandments as thy fathers David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon woke. He woke up. Behold, it was a dream. It had been a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, offered up burnt offerings, offered peace offerings, and made a feast for all his servants. Joel chapter number 2. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. I don't know, I don't know where the line is between the visions and the dreams. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. 
on all flesh, on all flesh. Verse 29. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Everybody say these are those. Everybody say these are those days. How many of you believe that these are those days? If these are those days, then we ought to have some young men dreaming some dreams and some old men seeing some visions. Problem is, is it's pretty easy for young men to dream dreams. Derek wants to play in the NBA. He got to be able to beat his preacher first, but he wants to play in the NBA. That's a good dream. It's easy for young men to dream dreams, and I'm preaching to young men because I want you to dream dreams. But for those of you that are older, and I'm old enough now that I understand what I'm about to say, it's harder for old men to see visions because our dreams have been dashed and promises have been broken. Hearts have been destroyed. So I'm preaching to some old men. I need some of you old men to wave your hand. Yeah. I want you to see some visions today. I feel the Holy Ghost in the house, and I'm, I need to put the microphone down and run around a little bit. Can you put your Bibles down if, or your phone down or whatever you got in your hand down? Let's put our hands together and let's give the Lord. God bless you. If you're going to preach with me a while, you can be seated. If not, you get to stand with me. Amen. There was a late 19th century scientist. His name was Sigmund Freud. And scientist is a pretty strong word. He was a neuropsychologist. And he was the first one to really study dreams. And he thought of dreams, and I, you've got to listen to me because I want to piece some things together that you've got to get a hold of today. He thought of dreams as an interaction between the unconscious and the conscious. He tried to figure out what was going on. He had, uh, when he passed on, he had one great student named Fritz Perls, and he took this science of dreams to the next level. And Fritz came to the understanding and the reality that dreams are part of the self that has been ignored. Um, they're part of the subconscious that's been rejected, part of your life that has been suppressed. A recent poll done said 56% of Americans believe that dreams have meaning. Most of the time when I remember the dreams, what my dreams mean is the pizza was terrible. But everybody dreams. Two scientists recently at the University of California discovered that there is a theta rhythm to our dreams. Our mind is has an oscillatory pattern, and I looked all that up, and you ought to look it up. There's a, when you go to sleep, your, your brain starts to heal itself from the damage of the day. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever sit down at night and you thought, oh, my. I don't even want to think. I don't even want to think about what channel I want to watch. Then your kids are talking to you and you don't even know. You just want them to go away. Some of you are doing that right now. Why? Because you're, you're, you you may have not physically exerted yourself a lot that day, but you're, those of you that have desk jobs and people don't understand, well, I've been digging ditches all day and you've been sitting at a desk and you say you're tired. But your brain gets tired just like your legs get tired or your arms get tired. And at night, it, this electrical activity starts healing your brain from all the damage of the day. And while it's healing itself, different thoughts are, you ever woke up and thought some crazy stuff and it was six pieces of six, six different things that happened that day and they're all, you're all trying to put them in one dream and, you know, anybody know what I'm talking about? 
And you woke up and you said, oh, you know, I was, I was, I, 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 I was fishing and a golf ball hit me in the head, and and I, I, I was, I was uh, at Western Sizzling. You know, it's crazy like that. So, during our lifetime, listen to this. This is an amazing statistic. During our lifetime, you will spend approximately six years dreaming. You will dream approximately two hours a night, five minutes to 20 minutes per dream, six to 24 dreams a night. You will dream six, between six and 24 dreams every night. Does anybody remember what they dreamed last night? But you did. Perhaps the greatest dreamer that ever lived was Solomon. He was a dreamer. And because he was a dreamer, the Lord loved him. Let me say this, and let me take all ambiguity out of the way. God loves people who dream. God loves people who remember their dreams. God loves Solomon so much that Nathan the prophet didn't call him Solomon. He called him Jedediah, which means beloved of God. And I believe the reason that he was beloved of God is because he was a dreamer. God loves Solomon. God loves Solomon because he had dreams. But just because he had dreams didn't make his life easy. We think of Solomon as the wisest, as the richest, as the greatest king. But he was a long ways from that when he first had his dream. He had a dream. He was a dreamer. God loved him, but he had to fight for everything that he got. I'm going to tell you, God's going to give you a dream, and you're going to have to learn how to fight for it. I'm preaching to somebody, and I'm going to preach to somebody. I'm going to get in your grill before I'm done, so hang on. If you want to accomplish something in your life, please listen to me today. Solomon was a dreamer, but he had to fight. In 1 Kings chapter 2, Solomon began his reign. And before that chapter was over, he had enemies. I said in 1 Kings chapter 2, he started ruling. And before that one chapter was over, he already had enemies. His half-brother, Adonijah, tried to be king. Joab, the man that was most loyal to his father, the great general Joab who, who, who forged the greatest fighting army that perhaps had ever existed up until that day. Joab was this great general. Joab rejected Solomon and wanted Adonijah to be king. So he was not only fighting his brother, he was fighting Joab, his dad's general. Adonijah, his brother, had to be dealt with. Abiathar, his father's priest, who was so loyal to his father David, had to be banished from the kingdom. This is happening. This is like, hey, you're king, and here's Adonijah, and here's Abiathar, and here's Joab. Then Shimei, anybody remember who Shimei? He was the last descendant of King Saul. He had to be confined, and David said, don't you allow Shimei to hang around here anymore. He's caused enough trouble. You get rid of him. So this great dreamer, well, what would you and I have done? Would we have stopped dreaming? Would we have said, well, I had too much pizza, or that didn't really matter? God wasn't really talking to me. No, God was really talking to you. Maybe it's a good place for me to make this point. Adversity comes to people who dream. I'm going to get somewhere in just a minute if you'll just stay with me. Solomon, you are beloved of God but you're going to have to fight for everything that you've got. Jacob was a dreamer, one heartache right after another. Joseph was a dreamer, and his brothers hated him for it. His own brothers wanted to kill him because he was a dreamer. Paul was a dreamer, perhaps the great evangelist that converted the world. He was a great dreamer, but the Scripture said he had many adversaries. If you don't have any enemies, you're probably not a dreamer. Solomon, you're beloved of God, but God is no respecter of persons. And all dreams come with some assembly required. 
And I just did a little bit of research and listen to what, before the dream chapter, there was a fighting chapter. Before the answered prayer chapter, there was a struggle chapter. Before the exaltation chapter, there was an abasement chapter. Before the increase chapter, there was a decrease chapter. Before the dawn chapter, there was a darkness chapter. And before the victory chapter, there was a battle chapter. You're just never going to have victory without having without fighting a battle. You're just never going to see a dream come true without some struggle, without some decrease, without some darkness, without some abasement. Babies are wonderful, beautiful things, but they come through a struggle. And dreams are like babies. They are born in a struggle. And struggles are necessary. Why are struggles necessary? I hadn't got but one amen, and that's from Brother Rogers, and he amens me more than anybody else. So, so I'm going to discount that one. I need some amens. That's good, wouldn't it? <laughs> why are struggles necessary? Why do, I have to, why do I have to go through this? Why am I dealing with this garbage? Why am I fighting these stupid battles? Why is life, ever, I mean, we just got it figured out. Things were just going good and boom. My wife and I were sitting at a restaurant in Houston, Texas a few months ago. And uh, things are going pretty good. You know, things are going pretty good. And, I, I, and, and I, she said to me or I said to her, I don't remember what it was. And I said, you know, we've, we've, we made it. It's going to be okay. It wasn't, honestly, you can ask her, it wasn't 10 seconds. It wasn't 10 seconds till my phone beeped. And I got an email, and it was about as bad a news as I could possibly get. Anybody been there? Why do we have to struggle? Why do we have when our dreams are like, why do they have to be born in the storm? The reason that we struggle is because if we didn't struggle, we would never learn to trust. But what I am learning through my struggle to see my dreams come true is that I must learn to trust God with my dream. I must learn to trust God with my vision. I must learn to trust God with my goals. And if I can trust him through the struggle, he'll get glory from the dream. In Solomon's dream, he, he began to praise God. He tells God, he said, I can't make it without you. God loves that kind of talk. So does your wife, fellas. God loves that kind of talk. I, I can't make it without you. I, I, I need wisdom, and I don't need my wisdom. I need your wisdom. And so God went the extra step, and he not only gave him wisdom, but he gave him riches. And it gave him a long life. And you can look back and you can read in Kings. You've got to kind of read between the lines. But there were things happening in Solomon's day that we're just now discovering again. Solomon was so wise, it said his ships sailed and they returned. They found Hebrew inscriptions in, in copper mines in Indiana. They found he was traveling around the world. His ships were traveling around the world. It took Ferdinand Magellan three years to sail around the world. The Bible says Solomon's ships would leave and they would return every three years loaded down with gold and precious stones and silver. He was sailing around the world before they knew the world was round. He knew about botany. He knew about engineering. He knew about medicine. He knew things that we still haven't discovered yet. I believe in the scriptures very plain, I believe he was the wisest. And I believe he was the wealthiest man that ever lived. Wow. All because of a dream. Anybody ready to have a dream like that? God gave him wisdom. God gave him riches. God gave him honor. God gave him a long life. His, he, he gave him so much honor and so much riches and so much wisdom that when the queen of Sheba came, she was a very wealthy lady herself, and when she saw the riches and the wisdom and how his servants went out and how they came in and how happy his people were, the Bible said there was no more spirit. She passed out. She physically fainted from the sight. 
Matthew 6 and 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. That's what Solomon did. He put God first. Amen. You know, he, he was anointed king, and immediately after king, after being anointed king, he took a nap and had a dream. You're not going to rule long without a dream. You're not going to make it long without a dream. Carl Sandburg said nothing happens without one. Nothing happens without a dream. All of our potential is locked up. Uh, all of our intelligence, all of our ability is locked up until we dare to think we can do better, until we dare to have a vision about the future that's better than today. We need to quit worrying about today, and we need to start worrying about our dream because without a vision, my people, Solomon said, if you don't have a vision, you're going to die. We got people sitting on a pew, well, I'm 60 or I'm 70 or I'm 20 or I'm 15, and my girlfriend just broke up with me. I think my life is over. You don't have any idea what you're talking about. God wants to give you a dream. Well, I'm 60 years old or I'm 38 years old and I got a bad report from the doctor. God's going to give you a dream. <laughs> Coach had a heart attack a week ago. He's 38. God's going to heal that heart and make a greater, give him more tomorrow than he ever had yesterday. And I'm standing firm on that word and we're going to agree together. How many of you believe that God can do that right now? Amen. But what Satan does, he's a master. He's a master at stealing your dream. Because if he steals your dream, you will do nothing. If he steals your, your dream, you will die, and the world will be none better because you lived. And if you don't hear anything else, I want you to hear these next two sentences. And I'm preaching to more than one person in this room right now. What you have right now does not mean much, but what you dream means everything. Victories in the day are made possible by dreams at night. Our dreams and our vision become our burden, and our burden becomes our destiny. If you don't have a burden, if you don't have a, 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 a load that you're carrying in order to accomplish a goal, it's because you haven't had a vision. It's because you haven't had a dream. But when you have that vision, when you have that dream, it becomes your burden. And sometimes it looks like it. Sometimes your burden looks negative. It's not negative. I'm living my dream. And that burden is my destiny. He's carrying that cross down the Via Della Rosa. That was his destiny. What was his dream? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father. What's he saying? My dream was that one of these days I'm going to stand in this place called heaven, and there's going to be millions, there's going to be a throng of heavenly hosts singing glory to God in the highest. And it was that dream of a saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost-filled group of people that caused him to carry the cross. The cross was part of the dream. You think it would have done it without a vision? You think it would have carried it without a dream? Oh, no. We'd still be lost as a goose in a snowstorm today if the Lord himself hadn't had a dream. Thank God. Thank God. You know, we... we I asked Curtis one time, I said, Curtis, what do you want to be when I grow up? He said, I don't, when you grow up, he said, I don't care, I just want to be rich. <laughs> Can I get an amen? But in order to be rich, you got to be something. 
I've got a friend, his name is Wayne, and uh, he lives in Texarkana, Texas. Hadn't seen him in several years. But he started when he was 12 years old digging, literally digging ditches with a shovel. And you know what he decided? He said, I'm going to be the best ditch digger the world has ever seen. He's worth millions and millions and millions of dollars. And he has a ditch digging company. He puts in pipeline, gas pipe and water pipe and sewer pipe all over America and literally all over the world. But he started out with a shovel when he was 12 years old. He said, I'm going to be the best ditch digger I, you've ever seen. Whatever your hands find to do, you do it with all your might. Well, all I'm doing is flipping burgers. Well, you may own a chain of restaurants one of these days. Whatever you're doing, just do it with the best. Come on, somebody say you can. Because you will not accomplish anything. Without a dream, and you tell me your dreams, and I'll tell you who you are. And can I say this, and don't please, I'm going to close my eyes, and I ain't going to look any direction, but if you don't have a dream, then you really don't amount to much. It's not about your education or how much money you got in the bank. It's about your dream. Salvation is free. But dreams are expensive. Lazarus was saved. But what was his dream? All he could dream about is if I could just get some crumbs from the master's table, and if his dogs would come and lick my sores, that was his dream. I don't know about you, but I'm not happy with that. Solomon offered 1,000 sacrifices at Gibeah to the Lord. And it was after the sacrifice that the dream came. Dreams are expensive. Uh, I want to be used of God. I want to build a business. I want to graduate college. I, whatever. I Have you been to the dream buying room? Have you been to the altar and said, whatever it takes in order for me to accomplish my goal, that's what I'm willing to do. Elisha told Elijah, Elijah said, what do you want? And Elisha said, I want twice what you've got. Elijah was the greatest prophet Israel had ever had. And here comes Elisha, and, and, and Elijah thought, well, you know, he's going to want to be my assistant, going to want to carry my books and make sure that everything's okay. And he said, no, I want twice what you've got. And Elijah said, well, you arrogant little stinker. He said, I'll tell you what. If you see me when I go away, you can have it. Elisha, why don't you go? No, I'm not leaving. No. Why don't you run grab? Why don't you run to town and get this? No. What, why? What are you? I'm watching you. Because you're not going away while well, I'm gone. I'm not leaving. Somebody else can run to town, but I'm watching you. And for years, he never took his eyes off that old man. He said, I'm going to see my dream come true. Mm. How bad do you want it? It's going to be the determining factor. It's not about talent. It's not about ability. It's not about intelligence. It's about want to. It's about desire and guts. Come on, somebody say amen. Hannah said, you give me a son or I'm going to die. And he didn't answer that prayer. And he said, so she wouldn't pray it again. She said, okay, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him back to you. I want him so bad that I don't, you can keep him. I just want you to give him to me so bad. And her dream came true in the person of the greatest judge that Israel ever had, a man named Samuel. Ooh, what a kid. But that kid was the answer.
answer to a dream. And she was willing to do whatever it took to see that dream come true. I said, they're expensive. I want God to touch me. I mean, if you need a touch from the Lord today, you don't have to wave your hand, but if you need a touch from the Lord today, are you willing to crawl through the crowd? Are you willing to be embarrassed in public and touch the hem of his garment? Are you willing to do whatever it takes? Is it important enough to you? Does it matter enough to you? Is your dream important enough to you to do whatever it takes? Dreams cost what they cost. They're expensive, and they never go on sale. And if you want to have it, you're going to have to pay for it. Amen. Everyone who is trying to do anything, especially in the kingdom of God, is under attack. Man, doesn't matter. Do it anyway. I said, everybody who is trying to do anything, especially in the kingdom of God, is under attack. Everybody who's trying to do anything in the business world, you're, people are jealous of you. You're under attack. It doesn't matter. Do it anyway. Everybody trying to climb the corporate ladder and be the best you can be, people hate you for it. Can I, can I say this? If everybody loves you, You're not pursuing your dream. But because before chapter 2 of 1 Kings was over, he had been anointed. And before the chapter was over, he had enemy after enemy after enemy. God wants to anoint his people. He wants you to do something great for the kingdom of God. And you're going to be under attack for that, but do it anyway. Have you ever woke up from a dream and it felt real? I remember when I was a little boy, I dreamed about having a pony. They dream about Nintendos and stuff, but we dreamed about ponies and shotguns. But I woke up one morning and I dreamed I had a pony, but the dream was so real, I had to go look outside and see if there's a pony tied up to a tree. Anybody ever done that? I can tell you today, I was a little bitty boy. It was before I was 11 because we lived down in high school. I can tell you today what that pony looked like in my dream. And if that little pony come walking in, I'm like, there you are, buddy. What's going on? I've been dreaming about you a long time. Anybody have a dream like that? Hmm. Amen. Your wife ever woke up from a dream mad at you? That wasn't in my notes. But. When Solomon had this dream, he woke up. I'm rich. I'm smart. Where's my pony? He woke up and things were still the same. The only difference between now and before he took his nap was the dream. <laughs> the only difference. <laughs> he didn't just say, oh, well, too much pizza. Oh, well, I was so excited from all that anointing and all that king stuff. He didn't dismiss it. He didn't cast it aside. He didn't hang his harp on a willow. He began to invest in his dream. And he got up from Gibeah and he went to Jerusalem. And he stood before the ark where his daddy used to stand. And he worshiped and he sacrificed. Don't stop sacrificing. Don't stop reaching. 
don't shut up. Woman, why don't you shut up? The master's here. Bartimaeus, why don't you be quiet? Uh, if I can, if he can hear me, I can see. I got a dream. Keep pushing. Keep pursuing. Even when an old REO Speedwagon song, even when your strength is almost gone, keep pushing on. Canaan was a dream to Israel, the land that flowed with milk and honey. Cities you didn't build, vineyards you didn't plant. They dreamed about him. What was the problem? It was full of enemies. It had to be conquered. All the dreams were true but it had to be conquered. And in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 3, the Lord told Joshua, by little and little I will drive them out before you. It's not going to happen in what you got your dream today, Solomon, but it's going to take a while. A little, a little, a little, a little. One, how do you eat an elephant? One bite, just a little bit at a time. It's going to happen. By little, little. But what's the problem? What's the problem? We get impatient in the process. We go back to David. Solomon was anointed king, and he became king like that day. He had enemies, but he became king. What happened when David got anointed? Sometimes there's a gap between the anointing. And too often God calls us and God anoints us. And we get impatient in the process of the anointing. And sometimes there's a process to the anointing, and we don't want to go through the process. Well, we wake up, and we want to be rich and smart. Where's my pony? It's good preaching. God will grant you, you hear me today and I'm finished. God will grant you the desires of your heart so long as you're willing to work for it. Every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. I deal with business owners and men that own agencies, financial planners and insurance men and investment advisors. We do trainings once in a while, and I'm the dumbest guy in the room, but I always start those trainings. And when I start those meetings, I say, every day do something towards your goal. Every day do something towards your goal, little by little, bite by bite, day by day, investing in your dream. We've had enough hell in our lives that, Sometimes it's hard to dream, but you hear me today, God wants you to. The scripture says you have not because you ask not. And so the enemy knows what it says, and so he tries to get you to quit asking. What I'm asking you to do today is ask. Well, my family's been in turmoil so long, I, I don't even know that it could be. God, could you give me peace in my family? God, could you save my boy? God, could you deliver my daughter? God, could you bless my job? It's like I'm a dead end, but could you just do a miracle today? It was last week or the week before last. My business has been really good for the last couple of years and kind of hit a dry spell. I had that email I got and some of the things that happened, we kind of hit a really dry spell. And I told my wife, I, I just need something to do. And I asked the Lord, I got in the car and I asked the Lord, hey, I need something to do. And less than one week later, I've got more stuff to do than I've ever had. I've got more stuff. For, I'm, I, and I, I told her this morning, like, how in the world am I going to get it all done? Two weeks ago, I'm like, I need something to do. And now I'm like, what am I going to do? How am I going to get it all done? I need to be in like three states tomorrow. That's good. But you got to ask the Lord. 
you got to ask the Lord. You got to you quit asking him a long time ago because you've been beat up so much. You got to ask the Lord, hey, God, I need something to do. Hey, God, I need you to heal me again. I need you to touch me again. I need you to deliver me again. I need you today. Let's stand. whole adult life have dreamed about church. A couple of times in that process, I almost lost it. I'll be honest with you. If you'd be honest with me, how many of you say, I'll be honest with you, preacher, won't you? I'm going to be honest with you. Would you be honest? Raise your hand. If you're going to be honest, raise your hand. Okay. So those, those of you that aren't, those, don't lie in church. Just be quiet. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I've stood behind this desk right here when it was the very last place I wanted to be. The very last place. I, I stood up here out of responsibility and think, if I could just do anything but this, that's all right. I'd be anywhere but here. I've sat in that chair and thought, oh, God, I wish the electricity would go off. I don't have to stand up for you. Am I preaching anybody? But all my life, since I was a little kid, since I was 13 years old, I've been dreaming about church. A couple of times, the enemy's almost stolen my dream. It's cost me most of the money I've ever made. Most of my money is in this building. I've preached funerals when I should have been doing business. And a couple of times, I've not more than a couple, but I really wanted to just hang my harp on a willow and just say, hey, I've done my best and my best wasn't good enough. I had my old bishop, Brother Harden, he laid his hand on me and he said, I had a heart attack and I quit too early. He said, I quit when I should have kept going. And he said, don't you let anything make you quit. Because I never accomplished what I dreamed about when I was a young man. What my bishop told me, stuck in my crawl a little bit. Don't you quit. Some of you are tempted to quit. Some of you came to church today and don't even know why. Because you gave up your dream a long time ago. Shattered dreams and broken hearts. But God's still God. And so I want you to just keep every day You ever had to take any criticism at work for doing a good job? You're going to be criticized. You're going to be talked about like a dog. Can I say something, and, 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 and you, I hope it's on recording, and I hope everybody in the world hears it. The only people that talk about other people are complete losers. So why should you care what a complete loser says? My God, that's good preaching. I felt the Holy Ghost. If you still got enough strength, just lift a hand to him. Would you do this?
quick story. Maybe some of you young folks would relate. Y'all notice Mike's not here this morning. He's at, he's uh, not on the platform today playing the guitar. When he was in high school, and I wouldn't tell this story with him here, but when he was in high school, he was a pretty good basketball player. He was real good. I believe they won state his senior year, and he was the best player on the team. He could have played basketball just about anywhere you want to play basketball. The problem was he broke, shattered his knee. He had massive surgery on that knee, and he got back to playing, and he shattered his other knee. And all he had ever dreamed about was playing basketball. And you look at his knees, it looked like somebody took a chainsaw to him. So that became fairly obvious he wasn't going to be able to play basketball in college or anywhere else. But today he's uh, at a, a camp for basketball officials. And he's the youngest guy there. And if he wants to officiate in the NBA, someday he can. He's already doing college. He's already way above men that are much, much older than him. Because he didn't let adversity, during the midst of that, his father passed away. And so, he's 25 years old, and I've got some respect for him. Nobody's paying his bills. He's working two or three jobs. He's helping here, doing whatever he can do, going to college full time. But he's going to make it. He's going to make it. And whatever girl that's lucky enough to get him will be blessed. That's what I believe. Because he had a dream and he just never quit. I wouldn't say that with him here. Don't you dare tell him. I said, because I pick up on him all the time about doing better. So don't tell him I think he's doing good. But I'm just telling you that adversity does not mean that you're out of the will of God. Adversity means you're in the will of God. Would you bow your head with me? really lost and I'm speaking to the youngest to the very oldest in the room today if you've lost your reason to live if you've lost it I want, don't, I want everybody's eyes closed because I'm really asking this so we can pray together if you've lost your desire to get up in the morning to put one foot in front of the other would you be brave enough to just raise your hand. Yeah, there's hands all over the room. You put those hands down. Uh, why don't we all just raise our hands with those that raise their hands? This the enemy's after you. He's hunting you. But greater is he that's in you than he that's in. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I'm just not going to quit today. And the last question I'm going to ask you is, before we leave here today, we're not going to have you come to the front, but I want you to ask. been a long time a long time ago he was born special his mother said he's going to be a Nazarite don't you ever cut his hair he can never touch a dead thing he's going to be a great judge over Israel he's going to deliver Israel from Philistia he's going to be a great man he's going to be a great ruler and his name was Samson he would shake himself and the power of the Lord would come on him and he would do unbelievable things. He killed a thousand men with just a jawbone of a donkey. He carried the gates, thousands of pound gates of a city. He carried them. And the Philistines, they had to destroy him some way and finally he gave to a woman the secret of his great anointing. 
And they shaved his head and took away that Nazarite vow. And he shook himself, but he was just like any other man. And so they took him. And they put out his eyes with an iron. And then made him pull a millstone around in circles. And I preached about it not too long ago and said that they made him do sport. You look that up in the original language and I can't say it in this room. This great man, the strongest man that ever lived, the man that carried the gates of a city, killed a thousand by himself, born to be the deliverer. He was doing heinous sexual acts for sport. They destroyed everything he ever was. Every bit of self-respect and self-confidence he ever had was gone. But the Bible said the Philistines wist not or they forgot and the hair of Samson's head began to grow again. One day he felt that long hair brushing down his back. Well, I remember what that felt like. Ooh. And the little boy that led him around because he was blind, he said, hey, son, could you take me to the pillars of the temple? He said, yeah. He led him over the pillars of the temple and he prayed a prayer. He said, Lord, I made a lot of mistakes. But can I just feel it? One more. His greatest act was yet to be done because he felt it again. Felt that anointing again. Felt that spirit again. God wasn't finished with him yet. He dared to dream again. Felt that hair again. Praise God. It's your time to shine. It's time for the history books to say something about what happens in your life. It's up to you. One more time, let's give him some praise in the house today. God has, if you look at history, this is the greatest time in history to be alive. The greatest time in history. God needs all of us. He needs the oldest. He needs the youngest. God needs all of us right now to accomplish his great will. Do you think God's will is great in the earth? you think God's dream for this earth is great? He chose us to fulfill that great dream in this earth. We live in the greatest time of history. We don't need to let the 
enemy steal our dream. We need to hang on to it. Forget what you've done, what the failures and mistakes of the past and your defeats of the past. Let's look for tomorrow, what God wants to do with us tomorrow. Amen. Walk out of here in the anointing of the Holy Ghost. God bless you. God speak to you. We'll see you Wednesday night.